Well, I'd like to uh, echo the provost's thanks to everybody who's put time into this, and I'd like to thank Dr. Schleifer for the warm introduction. And today, what I'm going to tell you about, um, I came up with this snazzy title to try to snag the attention of the Provost Lecture Series Committee, and it apparently worked. Um, I'm going to tell you about a particular particle, um, <clears throat> particular fundamental particle called the muon, and the role it's playing in the ongoing revolution in particle physics. And I'll tell you what I, I mean by all that in a bit. Um, so I always start these talks out with a little outline, and I tend to, out, I tend to uh, run my talks on the outline paraphrased by Don Rumsfeld. We're going to start with the known knowns. What do we know? What do we think we know about the universe? Uh, then we're going to move on to the known unknowns. What's wrong with what we know? What do we know is wrong with what we know? And finally, I'll move on to the other stuff, the unknown knowns and the unknown unknowns. Um, and down here, this part of the talk is where I'll tell you about the work uh, that uh, Dr. Pop and I are doing in collaboration with uh, scientists all over the world on a number of experiments. So you've got to start off these particle physics talks by telling people what we think we know about the universe. <clears throat> and let me start with an example uh, to sort of set the stage. So one of the things we know about is gravity. We know there's this universal law of gravitation. Things fall, right? Newton came up with gravity after staring at apples falling off trees. This he told his biographer. I think we can probably believe that. But then he looked up and he saw the moon. And he said, well, if apples are falling towards the Earth, is the moon also falling towards the Earth? And <clears throat> he wrote down a mathematical theory that explained in the same equations why both the apple and the moon fall and came up with this universal law that we think describes, at least on uh, the size of the solar system, how gravity works. And Einstein had to come along 300 years later and explain to us what happens in much bigger and more powerful systems. But again, he wrote down a law of gravitation that's fundamental. And I'm not going to I'm not going to um, burden you with the equations because this isn't a this isn't a talk to a physics class. But what you should take away from this is that things as diverse as an apple falling to the ground and two black holes merging together somewhere in the cosmos are governed by the same fundamental rule, and that allows us to understand and to predict what's going to happen when we bring two things near each other. Okay, but we understand a lot more than gravity. Right? We understand chemistry. We understand the structure of the periodic table and why it looks the way it looks. We understand our favorite chemicals. This is one of my particular favorites. Uh, $100 of the provost's money to anybody who can identify this at the end of the talk. You got it. <laughs> Speak to the provost after the lecture. Uh, <laughs> we also understand we can explain, we can describe climate, weather, lightning. Um, we understand rainbows. We understand how they arise. We understand why it's darker on the outside of a rainbow than on the inside of a rainbow. I can tell you why the lights in this room work, why the lights on the street work. I can explain to you how advances in medicine like the MRI and the CR <coughs> and the, um, you know, all the other medical imaging uh, work. And I can explain to you where the internet comes from and how we make it function. You know, how we can send vast volumes of data across a fiber the size of your hair. Okay? All of these things are very, are, are easily described by the models that we've written down as physicists, experimentally verified. Okay? But I don't want you to get the impression that just because I can describe everything that you've ever seen, that we actually understand anything. Okay? We don't really understand very much at all about the universe. Okay? For instance, we have, we have these theories, and I'll talk about the, that theory in a, in a minute, that we think can describe everything, but we don't always understand where all the parts of that theory come from. So what do I mean by that? Um, we have this theory, which is an equation that we've written down that describes the outcome of an experiment. So if you give me a setup for an experiment, I can predict how it's going to turn out. Okay? But I don't understand necessarily why that equation has the form it does, or why I can describe the experiments that I can describe. 
Okay? There's certain things that, that we do understand and certain things that we don't. And, and here's just a list that I pulled off the top of my head of things that we know about, things that we like to do in everyday life that we don't understand. So we know that the universe is about 14 billion years old. We don't know why we happen to be here at this point in time. Why not 10 billion years ago? Why not 10 billion years from now? Okay? Um, you've all heard in the news about things called dark energy and dark matter, very exciting, cutting edge pieces of cosmology. We don't know what those are. I'll mention them a little bit later again, but we don't really know what those are. We can't describe for you from these fundamental equations of physics how emergent systems arise, so things like life. How does life arise out of the equations we've written down? I, don't even, I can't even begin to explain to you how that works. So while life is there and all these other things, they're all there. And in hindsight, we can sort of describe how the processes work. I can't necessarily predict ahead of time that we would have ended up with life here as opposed to somewhere else in our solar system or our galaxy. Okay? So in order to describe, you know, the next step, that what is this theory that I'm going to tell you about, I kind of have to describe what a scientist means by a theory. It's very different than what, you know, we talk about in the media. A theory is not a guess. A theory is not a speculation. A theory consists of two pieces, at least to a physicist. It consists of a mathematically consistent framework for doing calculations in. And the framework that I, the, the theory that I'm going to be talking about, its framework is something called relativistic quantum field theory. I'm not going to try to teach you relativistic quantum field theory today because that's a graduate course. And while I used to be a theorist, I probably am no longer qualified to teach you, even as a graduate course, uh, that material. But the th the, the mathematical framework doesn't tell you what's in the universe. The mathematical framework just tells you how to go about making calculations. You have to have another piece. You have to have a realization of that framework, a model, that contains all of the stuff that we know is in the universe. And for a particle physicist, the model that we use that's built on quantum field theory is called the standard model. It's a, it's a kind of a boring name for um, what is, in fact, one of the most successful scientific theories that's ever been written down on paper. Okay? The standard model describes everything that we think we know about the universe. And I'm not going to write an equation for you, but I'm going to put up some pictures. So the standard model describes the forces that we know are in the universe. So there are, there are four forces that we know of, three of which I've shown here. One of them is called electromagnetism. It's a thing that's responsible for chemistry. It's responsible for the lights working here. It's responsible for the internet. Okay? There's another force called the strong nuclear force, which binds the nuclei of atoms together. And there's another force that's, that's called the weak nuclear force. And this is responsible for atoms falling apart in radioactive decay or for nuclei merging together in nuclear fusion. Okay? And we believe, based on experiments, that these three forces are actually transmitted between particles in the universe by a set of particles that are given the name gauge bosons. You all know, and I've already mentioned, another force, this fourth force called gravity. And I, I can't talk about all the forces without mentioning gravity. The problem is um, gravity sort of has to sit over here on the side. All right? Gravity isn't really part of the standard model because we don't understand gravity in the same way that we understand these other forces. Gravity is a purely classical uh, construction that we could have discussed before the discovery of quantum mechanics. The rest of these forces we now understand in terms of quantum mechanics. Gravity, which is something we would like to understand in terms of quantum mechanics, is um, it's difficult. It's, it's being very um, troublesome. It's, it's trying to hide and stay out of, of yes, sir? What's the origin of the, the name gauge boson? It, it has to do with the uh, way you construct the theory in a mathematical way, um, the way you write down the equations. There's, a, there's a, what's called a symmetry of the equations, 
which is called a gauge symmetry. It's, it's mathematical operations that you can do to the equations that don't change them. And it turns out that the quantum field theory that we write down is, is based on the gauge uh, interactions of these particles. Um, so I, I, uh, I should have come with the picture that describes that without equations, but uh, maybe afterwards I can draw you some pictures. So I've only told you about one side of the picture. I've told you about the forces. But forces aren't all there are. There's got to be stuff to have forces between, right? So there's another block of particles that make up matter. There are these particles called quarks, which are particles that feel this strong nuclear force. And there's a block of particles called leptons, which don't feel the strong nuclear force. Why? Beats me. It's an, it's, an area, it's an area of active research to understand why some particles feel these forces, some of these forces, and some particles feel others. It also turns out that when you stare at this uh, system, you notice that there are three groups of particles that I've drawn side by side. Every group in this second, in this first family, is almost identical to every group in this, every particle in this second family that's right next to it. So the up quark and the charm quark are almost the same thing. And there's a third repetition that consists of the top quark and the bottom quark and this tau lepton. Why are there three of sets of them? Beats me. That's also an active area of research. You know, there are, certain, um, there are certain people that claim to understand why there are three, and there are people that claim that there should be four or more. Um, it's an open area of investigation. All I can tell you is that we've, in, we've seen all of these particles. Okay? It also turns out that in addition to these uh, 12 particles I've drawn here, uh, there are a mirror set called the antiparticles. And whenever a particle comes together with its antiparticle, they vanish in a flash of light. Why are there antiparticles? Again, beats me. Um, again, an active area of research. Why is the universe mostly made up of matter? Why is there very little antimatter? Why aren't you flashing out of existence because you shake hands with your anti-self? Beats us. We don't understand that either. Okay. In everyday life, though, most of that stuff is irrelevant. For chemistry, for biology, for um, medicine, what's important is that those up quarks and those down quarks get together into the proton and neutron that we all know and love. We keep around the electron, and the strong force which holds the nuclei together and the electromagnetic force that does all of the chemistry and, and, and interesting stuff on the internet plus gravity, which again, we don't really understand. So we understand everyday life in terms of all those particles I drew a minute ago. So if I understand everything, or at least claim to, I should be able to go out and do experiments, make predictions. And in fact, there are no experiments we've ever done that are in conflict with the standard model. Now, I've been showing this slide for years when I give talks. And every year it gets a little bit more strained, so I, I kind of have to put conflict in quotes. So experiments disagreeing with theory, a conflict to a physicist means something different than it may mean to everybody else. By conflict we mean that there's a certain level of discrepancy between the prediction of the theory and the outcome of the experiment. And that goes by the, the name of five sigma in physics. It's the same idea in, in management, the five sigma effect, right? There are no experiments currently that are five sigma away. All the way from the very largest structures we know in the universe, galaxies, superclusters of galaxies, all the way down to the very smallest experiments we've ever done. That doesn't mean there aren't fraying threads here and there. There aren't little discrepancies that don't quite rise to the technical level of a conflict. I'm going to mention one of those a little later in the talk. But the, the takeaway from this is that the standard model describes in, in great detail everything we've ever tried to do an experiment on. And as such, it, it, it's justified to call it one of the most successful theories we've ever written down. However, as with most theories, there are 
There are issues with it. There are internal problems, mathematical inconsistencies, if you will. And I, let me mention a few of them. The first one goes by the name of the flavor problem, and it comes back to what the provost asked about. What's this idea of a gauge boson? Well, these gauge bosons have to follow this gauge symmetry. Which again, I'm not going to tell you what that means. But it turns out if there is this gauge symmetry and any of the particles in the universe have a mass, then this gauge symmetry is broken and the whole theory falls apart. Well, that's obviously a problem because things are heavy, right? In fact, for all of those particles I drew in that, in that picture earlier, I could draw the relative masses. And there, some of them are enormous. Some of them are very big. This, this, for reference, this blue one down here is the, this, the mass of the proton. And the top quark is enormously larger than the proton. It's enormously heavier than the proton. Um, we're able to sort of hack our way out of this problem. Um, we can write down an extension, a mathematical um, cheat, if you will. Uh, but that mathematical cheat just, just allows us to put these masses back in the theory. Okay? It describes them, but it doesn't explain them. So for every one of these masses, I have to put an extra term in the theory where I just write the mass in. Okay? I can't explain where they come from. In addition, in, a, in addition uh, I, I end up having to invent a new particle called the Higgs boson, which you may or may not heard of. Um, problem with the Higgs boson is we haven't found the darn thing. So if it's out there, it's evaded all of our best attempts to date to find it. And yet the theory we've written down, this standard model that I claim is so successful, needs to have this thing in order to work. Well, why do we think this thing exists? Again, we're physicists. The data tells us. We don't just, we don't just invent it because we'd like it to be there. The data tells us that it has to be there. Now let me show you the data. Um, what we do is we go to a collider and we take an electron and its counterpart, the anti-electron, and we smash them together. And the way we indicate that in particle physics is by drawing these Feynman diagrams. So time proceeds from left to right here. So I've got an electron and an anti-electron. And they come together and they do some stuff. And sometimes they spit out these W particles, which were those carriers of the weak nuclear force. Okay? And if we go to a collider and we smash electrons and anti-electrons together uh, day after day for years on end, we call that the large electron positron collider experiment at CERN. And we can count the number of times that two electrons smash together and make two of these W bosons. Now, without the Higgs boson, you would predict that the number you would see would, would follow this curve up here. Okay? With the Higgs boson, you predict this green curve right here. And in fact, all these points that you see are the data. The actual data measured in the actual experiments. And that data falls smack on top of the curve that requires there to be a Higgs boson. So the data is telling us, and it's not just this, this particular measurement. There are hundreds of measurements just like this that say there has to be this Higgs boson or something that acts very much like it. Okay? So we ran off and we asked governments around the world for a couple of billion dollars and they obliged us and we built this thing in Switzerland that turned on last year called the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Um, in it we put a number of detectors, so this is a big circle that crashes protons into other protons at the highest energies that man has ever created. And those collisions occur deep inside these detectors. And for scale, that's a six foot tall human being. Okay? These detectors are enormous. Uh, they weigh tens of thousands of metric tons. And there are four of these things at CERN. Okay? And what happens is these protons, a proton will come in from one side, a proton will come in from another side, they'll crash into each other, and they'll create a spray of particle debris, which this detector will measure. And then somebody that knows what they're doing, not me, will go to a computer and teach a computer how to identify what happened in that collision. Okay? And we'll do this over and over again. And eventually, 
the, the hope is that we will see the production of this Higgs boson directly in this detector. Now, the LHC is currently the highest energy collider in the world. And it's been running for a few months. And we expect, based on the theory, that by the end of, well, they say this year, but more likely by the end of next year, one way or another, they will confirm or refute the existence of this particle. My personal hope is that they refute it and something else comes along, which would be much more exciting than just confirming what we already know. But even once we've found the Higgs, um, we, we really haven't solved all those problems with the standard model. Um, let me skip this one. Um, because the standard model has other issues, particularly when it comes to looking at the large-scale structure of the universe. So there's this, this other problem um, related to what, what you've probably heard of in the news, is dark energy. Okay? What's this dark energy? Well, it's this thing that Einstein called the cosmological constant. And it controls the fate of the universe. As most of you probably know, the universe started with a big bang, according to our current understanding. And the universe is expanding. All right? And there's a couple of options. Either the universe expands forever and stops, expands and then recollapses, or it expands and expands faster and faster. And it turns out that's what's happening. According to the data, the universe's expansion is speeding up. And the only way that can happen is if there's this dark energy, this unknown stuff permeating the universe, pushing it apart. Now, we measure this cosmological constant in, in, in some wacky particle physicist units. Don't worry about exactly what the details are, but just look at this exponent. And remember your scientific notation. Okay? The measurement says that it's this wacky number. Okay? The standard model makes a prediction for what this number should be. Okay? Anybody want to guess what the standard model says? That would be nice, but no. It's actually much, 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 much worse than that. The standard model says this is 10 to the 167. Now, if you remember your scientific notation, you'll know that this number is about 10 to the 200 times bigger than that number. I can't even comprehend what a number that big it means. All right, that's a number that's so huge, I can't even give you an analogy for how big that is. So you could say that there's a tiny little problem here with the standard model. All right? if, the, if the cosmological constant were really this big, the universe would never have banged in the first place. Okay? The other problem is that this wonderful standard model that I've written down, uh, it only describes 4% of the universe. 96% okay? of the universe, according to cosmology, cosmological measurements is not the stuff I've told you about. Um, I won't bore you with the details of what these plots mean, but these plots uh, come out of those experiments and they make very definite measurements of how much dark energy there is and how much dark matter there is. And the bottom line is that only about 3 to 4 percent of the universe is this stuff that I told you about. So I have this brilliantly successful theory that describes uh, only a tiny little bit of the whole universe. Everything we can do on Earth, but only a tiny little bit of the whole universe. And we have absolutely no idea what 96% of that stuff out there is. Absolutely none at all. So, theorists having nothing better to do, um, and, and I was one, so I can, I can talk trash about them, um, they go off and they just sit there and they stare out the window Great some problem sets, stare out the window for a while, and occasionally we'll write down a formula. We'll say, what if? So what if there was a particle that had these properties? What would that do to our predictions? And there's, a, there's industries in, in, calcul in predicting all of these things. They go by all sorts of wacky names. Um, but the bottom line is that even though there are probably hundreds of these things out there, none of them provide a complete answer to all of these problems that I've mentioned. And they never will. Theorists are, are wonderful creatures, but they're stuck, just like the rest of us, without data. Without data, I can't tell you whether your theory is right or wrong. I can't tell you what rock to turn over next. So in addition to the, to the, the, um, the Large Hadron Collider, which we're spending a lot of money on, there are lots of other ways that 
particle physicists are going about making measurements, questioning the universe, testing these theories. And they, they're, they're put together in these sort of three broad areas. One of them is called the energy frontier, and that's where you make a machine like the Large Hadron Collider at higher and higher energies, and you smash stuff together with more and more force. So things like the LHC, uh, there are other smaller colliders around the world that are specialized for doing certain types of measurements. The other thing you can do is you can go out to the cosmic frontier. You can go out into the universe and you can ask questions about the structure of galaxies, the shape of the cosmos. Or you can do what we do here. Um, you can join experiments that go to the intensity frontier. So very high rate experiments where you do lots and lots and lots of measurements in a short amount of time. So let me give you an example of the two kinds of measurements that we do on the intensity frontier. The first is a question to you. How far is it from here to Central Park? Anyone have a guess? 14 miles. 19. 14 miles. 25. Well, A, it depends on how you get there. And B, it depends on what you mean by how far. However far we are from Central Park, it's clear that I'm closer to it than any of you are. And yet I probably would have given more or less the same answers you did. I actually checked on Google. This line here is actually 11 miles um, from, from uh, Jamaica to uh, Central Park. But I'm 10 feet closer than Dr. Pop is. Right? So is it 11 miles and 10 feet for him? Well, no. So the question about how far is it to Central Park is a question about precision. How accurately do I need to know how far Dr. Pop is from Central Park? And in principle, I can answer that question to any desired level of accuracy. Right? It's just the more accurate I need that measurement to be, the harder I have to work, and consequently, the more money it's going to cost. Okay? The other question, the other type of question I can ask is this sort of question. How many people are born with naturally fluorescent blue hair? What's the answer? Zero. Zero. Well, no, that's wrong. The correct answer is less than 1 in 100 billion. Why do I say that? Well, we've never seen a person born with naturally fluorescent blue hair. But that doesn't mean that there won't be such a person born tomorrow. right? So the best we can do is we can say, well, in the whole history of the human race, nobody's ever been born with naturally fluorescent blue hair. So there can be no more than one person out of all the people that have ever lived that had fluorescent blue hair, we'd know about it. Right? And the number of people that have been born over the whole history of the world, if you believe National Geographic, is about 100 billion people. That doesn't exclude the fact that tomorrow somebody could come along. Okay? So, it, it, uh, more generally speaking, those two types of questions that we can ask are described as, A, either precision measurements, measuring a particular quantity with more and more accuracy to compare it with a theoretical prediction, or going and looking for stuff that we don't think should be able to happen. Okay? And here at York, we are involved in both kinds of efforts. So these two efforts um, are, are working with mu these particles called muons. Uh, and one of them is called the muon G minus 2 experiment. That's one of these precision measurements. And the other one is called the muon to electron conversion experiment, which is one of these rare event search experiments. But I still haven't told you what a muon is. So I should back up just a little bit and tell you what those things are. What's a muon? Well, we don't really know. OK? I, you know, we don't know why they're there. We don't know why they're necessary. We know what their properties are. They're very much like electrons. So in this table of particles that I showed earlier, the electron lives down here in this first generation. And the muon is this thing that has the same properties as the electron, except it's in the second generation, the second clump of particles. And it's about the only fundamental property of it that's different than the electron is that it's about 200 times heavier. Why? Who? Beats us. It's an open question. Um, the other thing we know is that its antiparticle, the anti-muon, 
uh, has all the same properties as the muon, except it's, they're, they're opposite. So the, the muon has the same electric charge as the electron, minus one. Uh, and the anti-muon has the same charge as the anti-electron, or plus one. The two particles have exactly the same mass, so in many ways we can treat those two particles as exactly the same. Okay? Um, another way that I could describe what a muon is, is instead of describing it in terms of theory, I could describe it operationally. I could say, what, is a, what does a muon do? And well, over there on my oscilloscope, banging away, um, those are muons. Okay? What I've got over here is I've got an oscilloscope that's hooked up to two particle detectors. They're stacked on top of each other. And they're detecting muons. You're, you should be happy to know that every second you have a handful of muons that travel through you uh, coming from cosmic rays that collide with the upper atmosphere. And this happens every day uh, for your entire life um, over and over again. <laughs> so one way we can describe what these muons are is theoretically. One way we can describe what they are is experimentally in an operational way. Okay? Let me tell you what else we know about muons. Muons are actually very exciting because in the whole zoo of particles, not just these fundamental particles, but all these derived particles like protons and pions and things that I'm not going to talk about, muons are unique. They're unique because in particle physics terms, they live for almost forever. Okay? I know um, 2.2 microseconds, which is 2.2 millionths of a second, um, doesn't seem like forever. But this is to be compared with numbers like 10 to the minus 17 microseconds, which are typical decay lifetimes for uh, strongly interacting uh, particles. So 2.2 microseconds is enormous. 2.2 microseconds lets us do stuff with them. I'll come back and tell you what I mean by that in a minute. So what happens to the muon when it decays is it's sitting there and it says, oh, time to decay. And it pops apart into an electron and, and two of these neutrino things. Now the neutrinos most of the time just go zipping off. They don't interact very much at all. So in the experiments that I'm going to talk about, we don't have to worry about them. Okay? So for us, when a muon decays, it turns into an electron. Or when an anti-muon decays, it turns into an anti-electron. But what's ex the, next, the other thing they can do is they can, they can be involved not just in pure particle physics, but they can also be involved in nuclear chemistry. So if you take a negative muon and you bring it into contact with a proton, some of the time that will turn into a neutron and, an, and, and a neutrino, causing transmutation of elements into other elements the thing that the alchemists were, have been trying to do for centuries. Muons do them all the time. Okay? The other thing that muons can do, besides pure particle physics and nuclear physics, is, as my chemistry colleagues will recognize, they can do chemistry. Okay? This is a level diagram for uh, muonic hydrogen, where a muon stops in hydrogen and forms a mu minus p atom. And all the chemistry that you can calculate with electrons, you can also do with muons. And this is also an extremely active area of research, particularly in Europe, on the muonic chemistry uh, of, of electronic systems. So muons are unique in that they live forever. They're easy to create. We can create them at particle colliders, and we can use them as tools to study systems. They're easy to manipulate. Uh, they're easy to measure. As you can see over there, I just whacked this together in a few minutes. Um, and it's very easy to calculate things with muons because they're not strongly interacting particles. Um, and so <clears throat> what you want to do with them is you want to say, what can these muons do for me as a particle physicist? And the standard model says it only allows them to do things that are called lepton flavor conserving interactions. So here are all my leptons again. I just cut these out of my table of particles. And remember, these, is, these particles are from that first family, and these are from that second family, and these two are from that third family. Now a lepton conserving, a lepton flavor conserving interaction is one that turns 
an electron into an electron neutrino or a muon into a muon neutrino or vice versa. But in the standard model, so we can, we can write down interactions that change these things back and forth, up and down. But in the standard model, there's no way to go this way. There's no way to convert a muon directly into an electron. There's no way to convert one of these neutrinos directly into one of these other neutrinos. Okay? So the standard model only allows lepton flavor conserving interactions. So here's some examples. I can bounce electrons off of other electrons. All right? This conserves, I can take muons and I can have them decay. So this interaction takes an electron and it turns it into an electron. That's allowed. Okay? This interaction takes a muon and converts it into a muon neutrino. That's allowed because that's vertical on that table. The other side of the interaction converts an electron neutrino into an electron. You can do that too. Okay? But what the standard model doesn't permit is something like this, where you take an electron and an anti-electron, you mash them together, and you get an electron and a muon out. Standard model says, nope, can't do that. Not allowed. You're never going to find an experiment where that happens. And so the question you want to ask yourself is, well, OK, the theory says that, but is that true? Is that really what happens in the universe? And so what we want to do is we want to set ourselves up in a, with a system that, there, that this sort of event might happen. Can we build an experiment that if this happens, we can catch it occurring? And the answer is I don't know whether this happens, but we have built an, we are building an experiment. This is a $200 million effort um, looking for the following interaction. If I take a muon and I put it into orbit, just like an electron, I replace an electron in orbit around a nucleus, does it ever spontaneously convert to an electron without any neutrinos around? This is totally forbidden in the standard model. There's no way you could ever see this. Um, but many of those new physics scenarios I mentioned earlier that try to patch up these problems with the standard model, this flavor problem, et cetera, um, they actually predict that this reaction is going to happen. But it's going to have to happen with a very low incidence. Okay? And why do I say that? Why do I say it has to happen with a low incidence? Well, because we've been doing this sort of thing for a very long time. We've been searching for this interaction fruitlessly for, uh, since the 1950s. And what you should look at is these blue circles. This is a logarithmic plot. All that means is that the further down you go, you're going every, every, um, every line, uh, grid line that you go down, you're going down by a factor of 10. So today, we know that less than 1 in 1 trillion muons will spontaneously convert to an electron. Okay? Our goal at Fermilab, which I'll, I'll show you in a minute, is to go down to a level where if this happens more often than once in every 10 to the 16 decays, roughly speaking, we'll be able to catch it. Now, 10 to the 16 is a big number. Okay? It's, it's very hard to give you some idea of just how big that number is. Um, uh, so I'm not going to try. 6,000 times the debt. Yeah. I, the debt doesn't mean anything to me either, unfortunately. But yeah. It's roughly it, the ratio of the, the area of the United States divided by a postage. I see you all struggling to understand what that means. I too struggle. These, when, when numbers like this get so big, we can come up with these analogies, but it gets to the point where we don't really understand what they mean. Even the best analogies we can come up with are hard to understand, which is why we teach you all scientific notation. <laughs> okay? Now, in order to do this experiment, I've got to get, I mean, roughly speaking, if I want to see if something happens once in 10 to the 16 times, right, one in 10 to the 16 trials, I've got to get myself 10 to the 16 muons, right? In reality, I've got to get many, many, many more than that. But I've got to get myself 10 to the 16 muons, and again, that's way bigger than the debt. So where do you go to find muons in that sort of number? And the answer is there's, there are only a handful of places. 
Um, and particularly with the dollar the way it is, there's only one place that you really want to consider spending this kind of money uh, to do this experiment. And the answer is you go to Fermilab. Now Fermilab is this uh, many hundred acre facility uh, out in the suburbs of Chicago, which had the formerly highest energy accelerator in the world. Um, here is that formerly highest energy accelerator in the world. It's a big circular ring called the Tevatron underground. Uh, right over here is the buffalo farm. Uh, physicists are nothing if not environmentally conscious. Um, and so the idea is if we zoom in here, this is a, a, zoom in, a zoomed in view of the campus of Fermilab where the administrative core is up here and there's all these, all these curved ring things that you see on here are um, accelerators. They're storage rings underground. And the idea is that we will build a new experiment near one of these storage rings that will allow us to generate these enormous numbers of muons that we need. And the price tag for doing this is pegged at something like $200 million. This is considered uh, one of the most important experiments that the Department of Energy is going to be funding over the next decade. Um, <clears throat> so in order to search for one event out of 10 to the 16, um, you can't go and watch every one of those events and see if it was what you were interested in because you're going to run out of computers, you're going to run out of memory, you're not going to be able to collect that much data. It's a totally hopeless event. So what you've got to do is you've got to be very clever. And you've got to say, all right, 1 in 10 to the 16. How do I get rid of those 10 to the 16 events that are completely boring? And the answer is you get some clever people together, and they figure out that all those boring events, the electrons that pop out are going to be at a much lower energy than these conversion electrons that we're interested in. And so you build a detector that by its design is completely blind to those low energy electrons. So what you do is you, and, I, and I'm just showing you the, the, the tail end of this $200 million experiment, you build a little line that brings muons into a little target, actually a series of aluminum foils. And when I say aluminum foils, you should just think, yeah, the stuff in your, in your uh, cabinet at, at home, just aluminum foil. Um, polished up nice and pretty, but aluminum foil. And the muons stop in there, and they do chemistry. And they land in the lowest orbital of the, of the atom. And every so often, we hope, like 1 in 10 to the 16 or 1 in 10 to the 15 times, we'll have one of those conversion events. Those will generate a very high energy electron that will spiral through a magnetic field and interact with our detector. So we'll be able to say, ah, we saw one of those conversion events. Most of the time, meaning the other 10 to the 16 out of 10 to the 16 times, you're going to get a much lower energy electron, okay? Because it's just going to cover the decay of a muon. And remember, I told you the decay of the muon has a bunch of neutrinos in it. And since those carry off energy too, the electron that comes out is going to be much lower energy than the thing we're looking for. Well, those two are going to spiral through the magnetic field. And what we do is we take our detector and we cut a big hole in the middle. And those low energy guys, they have little spirals. So they're just all going to spiral down the middle of our detector. We'll never see them. The details, of course, are a tad more complicated than that. But the basic idea is you throw away all the crap that you don't care about, and you keep the important stuff. <coughs> so our goal is, roughly speaking, to observe one conversion in every 10 of the 16 events. This experiment is in the design phase. It's in the cost phase, you know, the budgeting phase. Um, and we should be taking data, fingers crossed, by the end of the decade. So what's important, to, one thing that's important, particularly for the budget people to understand, is that it doesn't matter what the outcome of this experiment is. This experiment will be a success whether or not we see those conversions. And so. The reason is that if we see those conversions, if we see one of these signals, then we have an unambiguous observation of physics that violates the standard model. This is what all physicists are hoping for, that we see one of those, these violations, that we open up a new vista that we can play in. But if we don't, all of these models that I told you about that are trying to patch up the standard model, they all make predictions that, we, that say we should see this in this experiment. 
And so if we don't see it, a lot of those, those theories that people have been working on for 20 or 30 years, we get to boot them right out the door. We say, sorry, try again. So either way, we, we, we make progress in the field. Yeah, so, so this experiment has um, probably 60, 60 or 70 physicists on it. And it's, it's, um, it, it's people from, um, you know, from York, there are the two of us from York. There's a lot of people at Fermilab itself. Um, UC Irvine has a bunch of people. The University of Washington has a bunch of people. Um, Rice, uh, Houston. Um, uh, I, I can probably come back. I mean, there's, there's, you know, um, it's, it's, despite those numbers, it's, it's a relatively small experiment in particle physics terms. Um, we know most of the people involved in it as opposed to the LHC experiments where you can have 2,000 physicists working on a project. And who's funding the LHC? Again, it's, um, the United States has a couple a uh, hundred million dollars in it. Uh, Europe uh, funds the majority of it. Uh, all the countries in, in, in the CERN treaty group uh, have, have required obligations every year. Uh, but then, you know, Russia, India, Brazil, um, Canada, Mexico. A anybody, that, anybody that funds any sort of particle physics research has money going into that through their university groups, if nothing else. So mu to e, then, is, is one of these rare event searches. So that's one category of things we do on the intensity frontier. The other category of things we do is measure stuff better, precision measurements. And this is neat, because we can do this with the muon. So I've got to tell you one more thing about muons. Um, they spin like tops. You can think of them as spinning like little tops. And our top was broken, so I unfortunately didn't get to bring it with me. But you, re you may recall that when a top spins, it'll wobble, it'll, it'll wobble around in a circle. Right? You've seen gyroscopes that do this, right? You, you spin this gyroscope really fast, you put it on a stand, and it goes around in a circle. Well, that, that event where it goes, the top goes around in a circle is called precession. And the reason it precesses is that there's a torque on the, the, the axis of spin. Okay? which makes it change direction. We can also look at the, the spin, the fundamental quantum mechanical spin of the muon in the same way. If I can put a torque on that spin, I can make it process. So I can make, just like the top or the gyroscope and in a gravitational field, I can take a muon and make it spin in a magnetic field. And a triumph of early quantum theory, in fact, the early triumph of quantum theory, um, that convinced everybody that quantum theory was really the way to go, uh, was in fact the prediction or the explanation of this famous experiment by Stern and Gerlach, where the basic idea is you take uh, a beam of atoms, a beam of silver atoms in their case, but you can do this with just about any kind of atom that has a spin, and you put it through an inhomogeneous magnetic field. And Classical theory says that when you put it through this non-uniform field, you're going to get this spray, this uniform spray of particles in the, in the vertical direction. Okay? But in fact, when you do that experiment, you don't see this classical uniform spray of particles. You see the particles coming out in two dots, two points on the screen. And it took many years to understand what was going on. It was clear immediately that this experiment was problematic for classical physics. But along came this guy, Paul Dirac, a British physicist. And he said, ah, if the electron has this new property called spin, this fundamental angular momentum, just like a top, it can point in one of two directions. It can point up or it can point down in this experiment. And that would explain uh, what's going on here. Um, in fact, he got the Nobel, Sterniger Locke got the Nobel Prize for discovering the effect. Dirac got the Nobel Prize for explaining the effect. So important was his discovery that it is etched on his grave marker at um, 
in London. Big Abbey. Everybody hopefully knows what I'm talking about, blanking there. Um, but Dirac's theory was not without its problems. Um, the problem, patching up the problem, this is, a, this is a, 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 a consistent story in the history of particle physics. You explain something much better than it was explained before, but you're still left with a problem. And that little difference from what Dirac predicted uh, comes about because in quantum field theory, uh, particles can interact with other particles in new ways. So, for instance, in, in uh, classical physics, you could never have a Feynman diagram that looks like this. Remember, time goes from left to right. So in this case, we have a muon that comes in, emits a, emits a photon, emits a quantum of light, and then interacts with the magnetic field. And then it comes back down here and gathers up that quantum of light that it spit out before. And this interaction, which can't happen in classical physics, but does happen in quantum theories, can be calculated correctly in quantum field theory. And Schwinger, <laughs> Julian Schwinger, is the guy that first did it. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you like going back and reading uh, famous papers in the, in the field of physics, uh, this one's a doozy. This is a really long, really completely impenetrable paper. Um, but the result is so important that he had it chiseled on his grave marker. Just like Dirac had his equation chiseled on his memorial marker, Schwinger's grave marker has the result of this calculation. Uh, the value of this correction to Dirac's equation is alpha over 2 pi. One of the most famous numbers in, in physics. Modern theory goes much further than that. We don't just have that one correction, but every particle that we know about makes corrections to the to this, the, this, this spin procession of the muon. And I'm not going to draw the hundreds and hundreds of them for you, just a handful of examples here. The point being, there are hundreds and hundreds of these that have been calculated. And here's what the theory currently, as of last week, more or less, says. And the number's not important. What I want you to take away from it, though, is that this number is 11 million and a whole bunch of stuff point something. And the uncertainty down here is a fraction of a part per million. Tiny little, tiny little error. And that's a theoretical calculation. Okay? Now you can do the same thing, or, or if you can do the same level of accuracy in measuring the spin precession of the muon, um, then you can compare theory and experiment and see if the theory is making the proper prediction. And in fact, that was done out at the Brookhaven Laboratory, right out here on Long Island, in an experiment that ended in 2001. And we're going to repeat this experiment. Uh, we're going to pick up the whole experiment. We're going to move it to Fermilab and put it back down and do it again. And the idea here is you put muons into this storage ring, which has a magnetic field in it. So the magnetic field makes the muons go around the storage ring in a circle. Uh, and while they're going around, the spin processes because it's interacting with the magnetic field. At some point, the muon's going to decay. And when the muon decays and spits out an electron, this electron has to have a lower energy than the muon that it started from. So it's going to spiral into the inside of the storage ring. And we put detectors all around the inside of the storage ring to measure the arrival times of those electrons. Yes, sir? Yes. Is it just the way you drew it, or is one of the particles going back in time? Um, can we come back to that afterwards? <laughs> you're, you're right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I can come back and explain the details of that a little later. All right. So we're going to do this experiment again at Fermilab. Uh, it's called the muon G minus 2 experiment at Fermilab. Very exciting name. And what we do to measure that that value, measure that precession frequency, or that precession rate, is we plot the arrival time of all the electrons at those detectors. And when you do that, you get a, a, a plot that looks like this. The, uh, again, this is a logarithmic plot in the, in the vertical axis. So um, what happens, and, and the plot wraps around. So we see these wiggles that happen in this plot, and then they keep going. And what's important is that they keep going for hundreds and hundreds of microseconds. 
for hundreds of revolutions around that storage ring, we keep measuring this wiggle. And the frequency of this wiggle can be turned into a value for this precession uh, property of the muon. And if you look at what the experiment measures, it's 11 million and a whole bunch of digits um, with some uncertainty at the end. And again, this is a fraction of a part per million. And then you ask the question, does this look, how does this compare with the theoretical value? Well, here's the table that does that. Let's ignore all the old stuff and just look at this experimental value, which is the number I put on the previous slide, with this theory value, which is the number I put a few slides ago. And you'll notice that with their error bars, they don't overlap. But I told you before that we've never seen an experiment that, that's in conflict with the standard model. And the way I get out of that is I point out that this discrepancy is revealing, it's a, it's a tantalizing hint. Because this discrepancy turns out to be just a tiny little bit bigger than three sigma. It doesn't arise, it doesn't rise to this five sigma level that physicists require to claim that they've discovered something exciting. But three sigma is so interesting because it's stuck around for a decade now that the Department of Energy is willing to give us $40 million to redo this experiment, to pick it up and move it to Fermilab. So uh, at this point, I want to stop. We're all getting tired. Um, but I hope I've given you the, the uh, impression that, that particle physics is, is a beautiful theory that explains very many things about the universe that we live in, um, but that because there are these internal problems, we believe that we are on the cusp of very exciting discoveries. Uh, and the muon, um, and particularly muon physics at Fermilab that we're involved with here at York, is going to play a very big role in understanding what those discoveries mean for our understanding of the universe. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Correct. Um, and decays to an electron and neutrino. Correct. The neutrinos, uh, so we've got all of this mass that's got to be accounted for. Does that go into the high energy electron? Is that why, why this electron is so energetic? Yeah, so ju just like we teach our students in, in physics 151, when the muon decays to these other particles, energy has to be conserved. Right, so it goes into the velocity of these, or the momentum, really, of these neutrinos and the electron that come out. And we can calculate exactly what the energy spectrum of those particles is. Yeah. Neutrinos would conserve spin. Correct. But to conserve energy, you would have to put it into something like the electron. Well, it, the, the neutrinos actually, since they carry momentum, right. they, that, that's equivalent to energy. How much? Uh, so the... The highest, that the, the highest energy electrons carry about half of the energy of the muon away, and the other half goes into, roughly speaking, goes into the neutrinos. Yeah, a good portion goes into the neutrinos. Which are much harder to detect. Correct. Yes. <clears throat> My question is a little uh, volatile uh, in the fact that we start everything to one base, the Big Bang. The Big Bang is correct. Right. Some Christian talk, God say, may there be light, and there was light. Light, light. They are the same. Now, the, the second question is, when I was studying physics, they said that God say, may there be light, and they give us the Maxwell equation. Correct. OK? So Got the t-shirt. <laughs> so in that case, let's suppose tonight there is the Powerball. Tomorrow night there is the Powerball. And tonight there is the Mega. I got million. And I ask you, I want you to de redirect your, your focus beginning 
and God say, may there be light. Would you do that experiment? I am paying. <laughs> Regrettably, I think a million dollars is not enough yeah. to no, do no, that no. experiment. This one will be one, 200 million. So, <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I have a question that kind of follows on to I think you maybe inadvertently overstated the power of theory to uh, describe how things are working. I mean, you said, if I give you the, if I describe the setup of an experiment well enough, you'll use current physical theory to explain the out, to, to predict accurately the outcome. And of course, if that was really true, we'd all shut down our experiments and everybody would go home because you'd already be able to calculate the outcome. So I think there's two reasons that's not true. One is a practical problem, which is if you have equations, you can't always tell what the equations predict. You can't calculate what they are going to tell you, what, what they would predict in a given situation. And there may be a problem in principle where they can't predict the outcome. So, uh, well, there you go. So what do you say to that? Well, I, cer <laughs> I certainly agree that, practically speaking, there are lots of experiments that you can do that I, can that I can't quantitatively tell you what the outcome is going to be from my fundamental equations here. Because the calculate, I don't know how to do the calculation. The, no the, one knows. No one knows. I mean, it's not just me. It's, it, in principle, we don't know how to do the calculation. Um, you know, there are lots of areas, though, where, where that, is, that used to be true, but we've learned new techniques. So um, numerical calculations of, uh, uh, of the masses of certain particles, 20 years ago, we couldn't even have considered calculating what the mass of the k on was, for instance. Um, but today, we have very accurate calcula numerical calculations in, in um, numerical uh, quantum chromodynamics that tell us within a percent or two, uh, the right answer for what the mass of the k on is. Um, so, there, so, so yeah, in, in principle, I agree with you. There are certain practical problems that we hope to overcome um, where we can qualitatively get the right answer, but maybe not quantitatively, because we don't have the techniques. Um, and, there, and, and yes, in principle, um, there are certain types of calculations that can't be done. Not just that we, that we um, we haven't figured out how to do the calculation, but even in principle, they're, they're, it's very difficult. So, so one of the ones that I, I'll go back to this, this example I mentioned of life. I mean, we, we can look at life as, as a biochemical system. And if we can do that, right, then we can um, go back to the chemistry and then we can take another step back to quantum electrodynamics and say, okay, yeah, we can, we can understand life as a physical process. But I can't even begin to think think even in principle how you would take quantum electrodynamics and predict uh, the sort of processes that go on in biological systems. These, these sort of emergent systems are, are an active area of research to even get to the, the in principle calculation. But qualitatively, I don't, think you, you, I don't think you have any problem saying, yes, quantum electrodynamics describes life. So quantitatively, no, but qualitatively, yeah, I, I believe it. I hope that I hope I hope that that fixes. <laughs> okay, my question. I had one more over here. I think did we? Well, I had more related to uh, popular science. So we've heard the recent news that the neutrino travels faster than light. Yeah, I figured that would come up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me, let me, so, so the experiment that's described is there's an experiment at CERN that, that creates a beam of these neutrinos and ships them off through the Earth to um, a lab. So CERN, is, um, CERN is, is at the border of Switzerland and France. And if you remember your map of Italy, here's Switzerland and France, and uh, a map of Europe. Switzerland and France is over here. Italy's way down here, about 700 kilometers apart. So you, you send this beam of electron or beam of neutrinos through the Earth to this detector in, in, in Switzerland, in, in Italy, Grand Sasso, OK? Now, the, the idea is that these two laboratories have synchronized clocks to within a nanosecond of each other, nanosecond or two. And so you know when you sent this beam of, of neutrinos, and you know when they arrived, because you measure when they arrived. And the claim is that um, 
statistically speaking, these neutrinos arrive earlier than they should according to Einstein's special theory of relativity. I think they're wrong for complex experimental error reasons. Their claim, their actual claim is we see this result and they specifically state in their paper, we are not claiming what the press is going to claim that we're claiming. <laughs> we're just claiming that we don't understand our result. They really say that in their last paragraph. But what they did up in Switzerland, to get, to, to get back to your question, is you take a beam of protons, which is exactly what we do, and you smash them into a target and you make muons. Um, and then you, well, you make pions and you let those decay into muons. And then those muons, you let them run down a long pipe. And as they do that, they decay. And the muons decay into these neutrinos and the electron. And then you put a wall and the electrons run into the wall and they stop. But the neutrinos don't really interact with anything. So they go right through the wall all the way to, Switzer all the way to Italy and out the other side of the planet. Um, so are my muons responsible for this result? Uh, uh, yeah. Technically, um, but I think the result is probably wrong for complex and subtle technical reasons. So, sorry. Uh, you mentioned about sigma phi. That's the number you're going to you know, rely on yep. for theoretical you know, establishment, right? Correct. Now, as a geologist, you know, we are okay with sigma 3. Does it make geology a better science? <laughs> it, um, in a sense, yes. Um, I mean, wh when I say s when I say five sigma, what I what I mean is that um, if you compare if if you if you do an experiment, there's some probability distribution around the value that so that the true value of this parameter. I put that in quotes. The true value of the parameter is in some distribution around the value you measure. And when we say sigma, we say well we're going to assume that that distribution is a Gaussian distribution. And so five sigma is a certain fraction of the way out on the tails. And it covers, you know, 99.9997% of all the results. Okay? So what we're claiming is that um, this result is different than this result um, by random chance less often than, you know, that whatever's left. You take 100 and you subtract that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something like one in a million. One in a million. Um, the reason we picked that is that um, this distribution is rarely Gaussian in reality. Um, and historically, we've done a terrible job of, of estimating what the real distribution looks like. So we, we tend to go, go way beyond what other fields would claim is necessary uh, because the number of, for instance, three sigma effects that disappear after further study should be like one in a thousand and it tends to be much larger than that so we, we require much more than um, would, would be required by pure statistics I have what you might call a money question uh, that is a, va a value question uh, the, the, uh, the history of uh, sophisticated thinkers arguing that apparently unrelated things really are important goes back at least to the parable of the ship in Plato's Republic, where he depicts some people not realizing the relevance of the stars to the navigation of the ship. Um, you spoke um, about the fun that you physicists have and, and how much fun it is to discover uh, that what you thought before is wrong because it's like creating new games. Sure. Right? On the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, you are uh, working in Europe and the United States where rumor <laughs> has it there have been some financial problems recently and yep <coughs> and you're ready to spend 200 million dollars 240 on <laughs> on one of your games correct okay so now this is not a hostile question this is an invitation to talk to us about the value of such research sure um, usually the way this question is is put is um, why bother? What are we getting out of it? Right? Uh, what that's practical that's result yeah, is? Right. That's, um, that's and much so, too for me. yeah, yeah. So the the uh, the answer that we usually give is is twofold. Uh, the first is, as academics, 
uh, we usually we usually um, retreat to the uh, knowledge for its for its own sake is a good thing, but in the in the budget climate, um, you 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 really have to go beyond that, and I, I personally believe you really have to go beyond that. Um, and so what I'm going to say is that the result of this experiment is going uh, these two experiments that I talked about are going to be completely and utterly irrelevant to um, the vast majority of people from now and forevermore. Okay. These are complex, technical, exciting physics questions. Um, so the payback is not going to be in the result we measure. Okay? Uh, the result, for me, that's the payback. But the, the payback to society is, is the, um, the, ancillary, the things that I consider ancillary to the result. So um, the internet, uh, I, I should say the internet, the World Wide Web, um, invented by CERN, uh, scientists to distribute particle physics results to their colleagues around the world. Go to any radiological department, right. in any hospital. MRIs, uh, x-rays, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the sort of argument that, that NASA tends to give, um, except that, uh, you know, we particle physicists it's, uh, actually have a, a pretty good claim on um, practical results that have come out as ancillary conditions to devel developing the experiments we've done. Um, so I can't tell you what's going to come out of this $240 million worth of, of physics we want to do. Um, but I can tell you that something's going to come out of it. We're going to come up with some new technique of calculating something, some new way of linking together computers to do complex calculations. Um, yeah, I mean. I, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that there will be outgrowths. I can't tell you what they are. Um, all I can say is that historically, the payback from particle physics experiments has been, um, has been greater than, than one to one. And Kevin, I'm anxious to hear the response to the question over here when you're done. OK. The, the, reverse time. Actually, I, I, the part I want to respond to Howard's question. We're so fond here of quoting Einstein. Uh, and he, he was once asked by uh, a, a reporter of what value. Are you hearing, Howard? A little louder, Stan. Yeah, I, I can was, always hear Stan. <laughs> <laughs> Even if he <it> can't. <laughs> um, of what value is the fundamental basic research? And Einstein is reported to have responded as saying, you, you might as well ask of what value is a newborn baby. Tremendous potential, but you can't put your finger on it right now. And I might point out things like Boolean algebra, which is a cute little game, but has tremendous application in computer science. Um, so um, the, the history of the, pay, the payback on fundamental research, I think, warrants our support in it. But isn't it also true that the United States backed off of building something <coughs> even more powerful than CERN? I believe it was yes. going to be in Texas. Significantly and, more. And in your judgment, was that a mistake? No. My, in my judgment, it wasn't. Um, the, the, it, 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 it was a long time ago, but the, um, uh, in my judgment, that would have been a much better machine than the machine at CERN. CERN is, the LHC at CERN is limited by the size, so, so the history of the LHC is that they dug a tunnel at CERN to put this machine called the Large Electron Positron Collider in. And when that finished its run, they took the LEP out, and they used the same tunnel to build the LHC in. And for technical reasons, the size of the tunnel limits, or the diameter of the tunnel limits the energy that you can run at. So it okay. was a mistake not to build in Texas. From a physics standpoint, it was a mistake. Yeah. From a, again, from a <laughs> funding standpoint, however, it was a mistake. What ended up happening with the SSC is that um, the technical assumptions that went into the design and the budgeting uh, to build the magnets that you use to bend the beams around in the circle uh, were completely and wildly wrong. And it turned out that the technical challenge of building the magnets that needed to be built to sustain the energies of the SSC machine in Texas uh, blew the budget to smithereens. Okay. Uh, so, you know, it's sort of like the big dig up in Boston. You know, you originally say it's going to be a billion dollars to build this tunnel. And 
20 years over, you know, 20 years late and $15 billion over budget, you finally finish. Um, and at some point, the Department of Energy said, whoa, you know, we, we can't guarantee to Congress where these budget overruns are going to stop. And Congress said, um, and I think from a, from a, from a financing standpoint, um, that was probably the right decision because if, you know, I want to do physics and if I'm going to sop, if, if, if somebody that's running over budget is going to sop up the entire budget for the entire field for the next 20 years because their stupid machine ran over budget, that's too much. Um, and, and unfortunately, NASA is in the same, the, same, uh, the same sort of boat right now um, with the, the James Webb Telescope. It's this, this, this it, they've got a budget problem where they were overly optimistic in the cost estimates um, on the, the, the hard technical things. And those hard technical things have st started to run away with them. And because of the delays and the budget overruns, and it, this, this thing is now threatening to sop up all the money for particle, or, or for astrophysics for the next decade. And so the astrophysics community is asking themselves the same question that the now that the particle physics community was asking themselves in the 80s, you know, can we afford this? Uh, and I don't know what they're going to say, but it's this, I, I, I think in the SSC case we made the right choice. Because we have a program now, which we wouldn't have had if SSC had eaten everything. The question over here. Yeah, the question was the, the, the thing out there. Yeah, my Feynman diagrams. Let's see if I can, uh... oh no, all right. Um, it looks like I'm not getting the juice I thought I was getting. Um, so yeah, so I had this Feynman <laughs> diagram where I had the muon, the, the, the muon, it ran up this way. And I had a particle that looked like it was coming backward and then go. So um, when we draw these Feynman diagrams, when, when we do these calculations, it, it turns out that we don't actually, technically, we don't actually calculate with a particle or an antiparticle. We don't really have to worry about the fact that that diagram makes it look like a particle is traveling backwards. Okay, um, those those diagrams are stand. They're, they're cartoons, but they're cartoons that are stand-ins for a particular set of, si of symbols in an equation. And so when we write all those symbols down, we don't talk about things going backward or forward in time. We talk really just about the topologies of the diagrams. So I could have actually drawn that diagram with, um, with the, the muon coming across to the neutrino and that photon going back this way, or the, the W going back this way. And then you would have asked me the question, is that W going backward in time? And I would have said, well, no. I mean, um, uh, in, in some popular interpretations, you, you will see them talking about how antiparticles travel backwards in time. But that's not really. That's not really the right way to think about it because we know from special relativity, for instance, um, that every event uh, comes after its cause. So as far as we can tell, things travel in one direction. And so we're really not, when we draw those diagrams, we really aren't meant to interpret them as things really going backward in time. We're really just meant to use it to convert um, a, a mental picture into an equation that we can do a calculation on. Just like you said that to illustrate a calculation is not meant to yeah. be absolutely literal. I mean, it's, it, they're not, li yeah, they're cartoons, they're not literal. The word is a heuristic device of Feynman, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I got an easy one. Let's hope so. Uh, early in the talk, you mentioned that, uh, among other things, the standard Particle, which we haven't detected yet. Correct. We haven't directly detected. All right. The popular yeah. press refers to the Higgs particle as the God particle. Why is that? It's a regrettable statement by a uh, um, particle physicist who, who wrote a book called The God Particle about particle physics. Do you remember his name? Letterman. Remember who wrote that? Sorry? Letterman. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's, based on that. it's based on that. It's based on that statement. And there's nothing more to it. It's nothing more to it. I I I think it was a uh, from, from a, a um, public relations standpoint, it was probably a poor choice of words. Well, it got a lot of attention. Sure did, <laughs> which was the intention. But 
I think from a public relations standpoint, it was probably a mistake. Okay, so uh, the standard model is great. Yep. And nobody's asked yet, so I know there's an elephant in the room somewhere, and I'm going to ask you. Uh, neutrinos definitely change flavor. Correct. And so is there any kind of explanation right now? Um, Besides yes, kind of yes. That. This is one of the reasons that I mentioned, you know, that I mentioned my, this slide that, that keeps, you know, I've been using it over and over again right. um, for years, but it, I, I have to keep close, stretching yeah. it, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. well, the, the um, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have, I would have had to put the conflict in quotes because of neutrinos and neutrino oscillations. Right. Um, today, we more or less claim that that's part of the standard model. We, we claim we understand it well enough that um, we can completely accommodate that within the standard model. Whether we're doing it properly or not depends on the outcome of experiments that have yet to be done. But we wrap that, that neutrino oscillation thing up within the same framework that we talk about flavor changing currents in the, in the quark systems. make sure you're not off the beat. I mean, how do you know you are even right? It shouldn't be 59 dimensions. Yeah. Um, how do you know? Those, those numbers that they come up with for the dimensionality of these different theories, ha, ha, the way those, those are act, those, the number of dimensions pops out of the solution to an equation that um, in, the particular, in the particular area of these superstring theories has to do with how many dimensions do you need to eliminate a certain anomalous interaction that destroys the symmetries of the theory? And we could, we could write down lots of equations later if you want to. But the basic idea is, you know, it, it, if, there were ten, if there were nine dimensions or 11 dimensions in those theories, there would be this symmetry destroying term that appears that doesn't cancel out, that ruins the whole theory that you were trying to write down in the first place. Thank you, Kevin.